Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in BST. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week, from the 21st to the 27th of April. I'm Features Editor Ezzie Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzie. It's good to be back. How are you? It's great to have you back on the show. I'm doing very well. Excellent. So what do we have to look forward to coming up in these April night skies? OK, well, i well, just quickly like to mention about the partial solar eclipse back in March. Did you get to see it? Yes, I did. Wasn't it fantastic? It was. At least in our part of the world, it was a bright and glorious day for it. We've had some very good weather. I know. I couldn't believe it. I was just so happy because I feel like every time there's a special event happening, it's cloudy and then, you know, we never get to see it. So, yeah, it was fantastic. Yes. (laughs) It does often seem that way. It's like there's something nice happening in the sky. Oh, it's cloudy. And in this (laughs) time, nope. Yeah. At at least for us in the, the south of England and Wales, we were all... Rejoicing. Treated to it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just so happy that we could see something at long last. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've got no eclipses this week, unfortunately. Oh. I know, boring. The moon is waning all week, though, and towards the end of the week, it's going to make a stunning pairing with Venus. And Venus will reach its greatest brightness this week, and we have a dwarf planet at opposition, and the wonderful Lyrid meteor shower at its peak as well. So no eclipse, but a meteor shower, so yay cool. That seems like quite a few other interesting things going on. (laughs) So why don't we hear more about them? Okay. So the moon, well, we had a full moon on the 13th of April. And now, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's waning all week. And on the 21st of April, the moon is at last quarter. So the last quarter moon occurs when the moon has completed three quarters of its orbit around the earth. And the moon's going to appear half lit at this time. And we're going to see it in the daytime sky rather than the night sky. I do love seeing the moon in the daytime. Mm. Be hanging out the washing and be like, oh, there's the moon. It's really nice, isn't it? <laughs> Again, when you've got a really nice clear day and you just see the moon hanging out there, it's it's always a lovely yeah, sight. it's lovely. It's really beautiful. And then on the 25th, the moon will be at perihelion. So it's going to be at its closest point to the sun, which is a distance of approximately one astronomical unit away. So around 93 million miles or 150 million kilometres. Mm-hmm. And then two days later, we have a new moon, which is always great news for dark sky observers. And it's also going to be at perigee. So it's closest point to the Earth, around 356,500 kilometres away. So still pretty far. Mm-hmm. It's not quite as spectacular when a new moon is close to Earth as when the full moon is close to Earth. No. But still worth worth marking, I worth think. Worth mentioning, yeah. So then, you know, people kind of get the idea that, oh, well, we'll be coming to a, a full moon soon. So mm. more of that in a couple of weeks' time. A couple of weeks, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Solar system-wise, on the 21st, we have Mercury at greatest western elongation, which basically means that the tiny planet is at its furthest from the sun and the morning sky. It's going to be really tricky to spot in the dawn sky because obviously it's going to be quite bright and Mercury is small and not particularly Right, so it's going to rise just after half past five in the morning and the sun isn't far behind rising at five past six. So if you are out, you're up getting for work, you will be able to spot Venus shining brightly in the dawn sky as it reaches its maximum brightness the following morning. And as always, if you are out trying to to catch these ones, especially in the morning sky, make sure that you have paid attention to when the sun's going to rise. Look it up for your local area because we don't want anybody getting hurt. Yes. Always that disclaimer, we always need it, don't we? (laughs) (laughs) And on the 22nd of April, Venus reaches maximum brightness. So it's going to be really dazzling. It's going to be unmissable, to be honest, in the morning sky. So it's going to be rising at around 5 a.m. It's going to be the morning star and shining at magnitude minus 4.8. And then a few days later, Venus teams up with the moon. 
So more of that a bit later on. But some of you may be wondering why Venus is brighter now than any other time. It just depends on its phase. The planet does go through phases, just like the moon. And it also depends on how close it is to Earth. So it's only when we see Venus as a crescent that the planet comes close enough to us to show its greatest illuminated extent. So its, its daytime side covers the greatest area of sky. So yeah, I think this is going to be completely, you know, unmissable. It's going to be very noticeable for people. And hopefully if I'm up that early, I'll be <laughs> able to, uh, to spot it. It's, it covers the greatest area of sky is one of those ones where it's, it's quite a complicated thing that you're trying to explain because it's not necessarily when it's fullest, but it's also not when it's like closest. It's a yeah. sort of balancing act between the two. Yeah. And then it's got the, as it says, like the biggest area, it seems the biggest. Because obviously when we talk about a full moon, you think, wow, big, bright. So yeah. this is kind of opposite. Yeah, because because nice. yeah, with with Venus, the closer it gets to Earth round in its orbit, the less of it you can see because when it's between Earth and the Sun, then you can't see it because we're seeing the back of it, which isn't being lit up. Astronomy always has this amazing way of just being completely complicated and backwards sometimes. <laughs> There's so it? many things that are counterintuitive. It's like yeah. any time when they sort of talk about things being on the sky and east and west being reversed. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking through telescopes which turn things upside down, but yes. different types of telescopes turn it upside down in different ways. Yeah. And <laughs> and the magnitude as well, lower the minus number, yeah. the brighter it is. Yeah, it's... It is. It is sometimes <laughs> a bit backwards, but that just makes it more fun. Yes. <laughs> Makes you have to think more, I guess. Yes, how to do a bit of mental gymnastics yeah. to make sure that you're awake in the evening. <laughs> and on the 22nd of April, we have dwarf planet 136108, Haumea. It's going to be opposition, and this can be located in the constellation of Bootes. It's going to be visible, in inverted commas, for most of the night, reaching its highest point in the sky at midnight. And I say visible, in inverted commas, because, you know, it's, it's very dim. It's like plus 17.2 in magnitude. And this minor planet is beyond Neptune's orbit. So, you know, seriously tricky to spot and it would really only appear as a pinprick of light through the telescope. Mm. So yeah, it's something that I probably would never, you know, being an amateur astronomer, never no. actually be able to pick out in the, in the night sky. But it's a really fascinating object. And as you can see in the picture there, as he kind of, just reminded me of a, a stone from an avocado. <laughs> I mean, that picture could actually be an avocado stone, and I believe it was an asteroid. It is quite rugby ball shaped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was actually like discovered in 2003. So fairly recent, I guess. And yeah. Yeah. And yeah, back in 2017, astronomers discovered a ring system around the dwarf planet, which was actually the first ring system discovered for a Kuiper belt object. Mm. These things are very far away and they are very dim. So that's one of the reasons why this one wasn't detected until 2003, because you have to do huge surveys to try and find these things, searching for, for very, very dim objects moving. Mm -hmm. So you need quite a big telescope with a lot of time on your hands. And those are patience. two thing and patience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, patience is something that astronomers tend to have in spades. Absolutely. Big telescopes with time on them, less so. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it's fairly recent. And, you know, it completes a rotation once every four hours. So maybe some of the more experienced asteroid hunters will enjoy looking out for this one. On the 24th of April, Mercury is at dichotomy, which means it's in its half phase. And, you know, we had some really spectacular views of Mercury in March. And unfortunately, it's now unobservable in the dawn sky because of the glare from the sun and I was so happy to see Mercury last month. It was visible from my front garden and I really wasn't expecting to see it. And I kind of almost was like jumping for joy at seeing it. Mm. It took me a good few nights to actually locate it. But I think that's because it was rising higher in the mm. sky as the nights went on. So, and it must've been a bit darker as well. So I was really pleased to, to see that. Yeah. So yeah. I know you were hoping to be able to see it, so I'm very glad that you've managed it. <laughs> I feel like I've ticked off quite a few like objects or events mm. in the past year. It's been actually a really yeah. good, good time for me in astronomy and 
probably a lot of other people as well. So as I mentioned at the beginning, on the 24th and 25th, we have Venus and the Moon close together in the morning sky. So on the 24th, the Moon is going to be a very thin crescent, only 18% lit and sits to the right of Venus. And then the following morning, Venus lies just above the crescent Moon, which is a lot smaller than it was the day before. It's now only 10% lit. So both are like roughly rising around the same time in the pre-dawn sky. And the sun is going to rise over an hour later. So you should have a nice bit of time to observe the two together before the sun washes them away. And Saturn, yeah, that's going to be in the sky at this time as well, located below Venus. But unfortunately, you know, it's not going to be visible. And the same goes for Neptune. It's in the same area of the sky, but we've just got no chance of seeing those two planets, unfortunately. But Venus and the Moon, they're going to look good together. Mm -hmm. And we have spoken before, haven't we, how magical it can look when those two are, are hanging around, either in, in the night sky or or in the morning sky. It's lovely. Yeah, when you get like the, the crescent moon next to a really bright planet. It's one of those things that even people who aren't astronomers, like you'll see it popping up on social media saying, mm. it's like, oh, the moon looked really cool. Yeah. What was that bright star? Yeah. It's a UFO. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And yeah, we have Jupiter, this amazing gas giant, you know, still hanging around in Taurus. It's shining at around magnitude minus 1.8, visible in the west as the sky as the sky darkens and it doesn't set until after midnight. And we do have Uranus as well in Taurus, visible as the sky darkens and setting at around half past 10. And Mars will be visible for longer. It's now moved into Cancer, becoming visible again in the west when the sky darkens. And it doesn't set until just half past three. So there are a few planets, you know, hanging around. Yeah, the planets have been really good. And it's it's just because they're not, you know, lining up all nice and neatly like they were at the beginning of the year doesn't mean that you should forget about them. That's it. And I love that Gemini is now constellation standing mm -hmm. on its the right way up. So <laughs> if you're out looking at Mars, you'll see Gemini, the twins, close by. Yeah, not standing on their head or lying yeah, on their sides anymore. Just lying, yeah. I was thinking the winter, it's like they're hibernating. They're just lying down. <laughs> waiting for the spring to... I mean, fair. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting for the spring to come round. Meteor showers. So a really nice meteor shower this time of year. So from the 22nd into the 23rd, we have the Lyrid meteor shower peaking. It's one of the oldest recorded meteor showers. And in fact, as it was like first recorded back in 687 BCE. That's a long That's time old. ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, very long time ago. So, I mean, how true that is, I'm not sure, but it's a long, long time ago. It's probably, there is something in the records that sounds like it could be a meteor shower. Yes. Which, to be fair, they, they do that quite a lot with things like eclipses and stuff. It's, it's one of the ways that they trace, mm -hmm. like, place historical events. Yeah, and I love the fact that Halley's Comet was on the Bayou Tapestry. Yeah. I love that. I think that's so cool. It's a, a nice example of when, yeah, these events were being recorded throughout history. So yeah, so the meteors, they come from Comet Thatcher. So as the Earth is passing through the debris left from this comet, we see this debris as meteors as they enter our atmosphere. And as the name suggests, the meteors are gonna originate from the constellation of Lyra, which contains the star Vega, and it's one of the brightest stars in the night sky. It's not a particularly prolific meteor shower, you know, it's around 16, to 18 per hour but they are very fast and bright so you're gonna have to be kind of quick on your toes if you like <laughs> mm. to see these and of course the best time to see them is going to be after darkness so on the night of the 22nd and into the morning of the 23rd so if you want to give it a go the constellation of lyra the area of sky where the meteors originate from will be rising in the northeast as the sky becomes dark and it should be a good one this year because we have no moon to interfere with the, the shower. So for best viewing, as he, you know, we all know it's going to have an, a, a clear, dark sky. Yeah. <laughs> That's one off your checklist. The other one is you have to let your eyes adjust to the darkness for about 20 to 30 minutes. So if you've just come out the house with the lights on, you know, you're going to need some time to let your eyes adjust to, to the darkness. Mm-hmm and look towards the northeast where Lyra will be located. 
and yeah but obviously they're not always just pinpointed at one bit of the sky are they it could be kind of from a wider area so yeah just keep moving your eyes around and and hope that you see some yeah meteor showers are always great they are one of the more random things when it comes to astronomy like so much of astronomy is dictated centuries beforehand yes. but with there's it's always it is a hunt you're trying to find these things mm. so hopefully some of our listeners out there will get lucky and be able to see a, a lyrid or two and it's still so exciting isn't it even like you and i have probably seen quite a few meteor showers now and that feeling of surprise and excitement you're like oh a meteor oh, i've just seen one it's mm. it never kind of goes away does it it's... yeah no, it's like i've seen like thousands but it's still ooh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> always an exciting event so yeah i just wanted to end this episode to talk about Alan Wallace. So yeah, so Alan was from South Wales and, you know, it, it was in the news last year when he passed away in March 2024. Alan was a very talented astronomer and astrophotographer. And yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was very sad that he passed away at the age of, of 34. And I found out the other day that there has been an Alan Wallace art installation installed at Cabangoch in the Elam Valley which is an international dark sky park in mid Wales. So the installation design was based on one of Alan's classic selfie portraits. And the only way I can describe it really is, you know, it's a, it's a piece of metalwork with the silhouette of his selfie portrait that's, that's been cut out. So yeah, this was unveiled on the 29th of March in the Elon Valley. And it was a collaboration between David Wynne Morgan of Cereba. I, which I hope I pronounced correctly, that means astronomy in Welsh. And also it was involved the Wallace family in partnership with the Elan Valley Trust and Welsh Water. So yeah, if, if you're out in the Elan Valley and you're at Craigoch, you will be able to find this installation on top of a rocky outcrop. Some of the pictures I've seen on social media, it just, it looks amazing. And I just think it's the most wonderful tribute to Alan. So I'm really looking forward to visiting that sometime this summer I, I think yes that sounds like a, a lovely memorial and there's some beautiful pictures of the night sky with this silhouetted image mm. in front of it so and it's so simple but so effective yeah I think it's a nice way to to remember him yeah and I'm sure if Alan were still around today he would be encouraging everybody to <laughs> get out there and to get stargazing absolutely as you summarise there, we have some absolutely fantastic things going on this week. On the 21st of April, the moon is at last quarter and Mercury is at greatest western elongation. On the 22nd, Venus reaches maximum brightness. Rising at about 5am, Venus will be a brilliant morning star shining at magnitude minus 4.8. On the same night, dwarf planet Haumea is at opposition and can be located in the constellation of Bootes. From the 22nd into the 23rd, we have the Lyrid meteor shower reaching its peak. On the 24th, Mercury is at dichotomy, which means it's at its half phase, but it will be unobservable in the morning sky. On the 24th and the 25th, Venus and the Moon are going to be getting closer together in the morning sky. On the 25th, the Moon is at perihelion, so it's at its closest point to the Sun. And then finally, on the 27th, we have a new Moon as well. So lots of things to see in the night sky. If you'd like even more stargazing highlights, please do subscribe to the podcast and we'll be back here next week with even more stargazing tips. From all of us here, though, good night. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player.